Mr. Speaker. In the history of this parliament, and for the time that I've served as a parliamentarian, whether in the House of Assembly or in the Senate, never have I experienced the behavior, the disrespect, and the arrogance of those who believe that they're entitled. I have served from 1987. 1987. I took a hiatus, went into opposition, served in the Senate, and returned. And never ever have I experienced the behavior and the despotic style of this uh, opposition leader, Mr. Speaker. But Mr. Speaker, it is really a shame it's really a shame that one who professed to be the Prime Minister in waiting cannot stand up at the moment in time to represent his people in this country in an appropriate manner. It's either he walks out or he keeps, stays away with the hope that he will not stand up before other persons and demanding the time that he speaks, Mr. Speaker. We see it in Barbados, Mr. Speaker, after the finance minister presents that the leader of the opposition stands immediately and makes his presentation. In St. Kitts, it happens. In St. Vincent, it happens. And in Dominica, it happens. And this government here in the last five years, as the Prime Minister indicated early on, he has always stood at that moment in time ready to defend the cause of his people. But you see, Mr. Speaker, they have no cause. They have no cause for being inside them, Mr. Speaker. The only cause that they have is to remain in opposition and to lead a party that has gone astray and is about to flounder under his leadership. That is what it is. But Mr. Speaker, of course not, sir, apart from a bow. But Mr. Speaker, we will move on. This government will move on to serve the people of this country with pride and dignity and respect to them all. We'll not stand in public and say, let the jackasses bray. Neither will we come here and play games with the business of the people, then run to the media and the others and to attempt to condemn a government that has demonstrated its commitment to the cause of the people. But Mr. Speaker, having said this, let me move to the business of the people. And first and foremost, Mr. Speaker, I must indicate how proud I was yesterday when one of our soldiers showed up, even, even when he is in a difficult time, a difficult moment, life-threatening time. He came and he spoke at the right time. He didn't hide in his home under the guise. They're walking out again, Mr. Speaker. He didn't, he didn't stay at his home, Mr. Speaker under the guise of being sick. He said, I am coming. I am coming to back for the people. I need to do it. And he stood there gracefully delivering his message, even in that moment of time, at moment of challenge, he came and he delivered. I want to commend him, Mr. Speaker. These are the men and women who sit on this side. These are the men and women who are demonstrating what it is to represent people and to serve them in, with dignity and humility. These are the men and, pe um, and women of this side. Mr. Speaker, but most of all, I must commend the Minister for Finance, the Parliamentary Representative for Castries East, for the spirit 
and essence the soul of his delivery. The element and contents and the ethos or philosophy of the estimates of revenue and expenditure for the fiscal year 2023-2024 as presented last Tuesday evening. And I'm reminded, Mr. Speaker, of the words, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. That's what came to mind when the, lead, when the member for Castries East delivered the estimates of expenditure on Tuesday. Mr. Speaker, this good and faithful servant has not only been good over a few things, but rather he has been good over many things. And as such, he is deserving of being ruler of many more things as our servant leader of the people of St. Lucia. Mr. Speaker, the spirit or essence of the budget, as presented by the Minister of Finance, is simply grounded in the philosophy of putting people first. Mr. Speaker, the spirit or essence of the budget is one of fairness. Fairness, Mr. Speaker. One of wisdom. One of intelligence and sensibility in keeping with the mantra of putting people first and for the people and country. Mr. Speaker, the element and content of the budget are those of consciousness, passion, and conviction to the cause of the people. Throughout the budget, Mr. Speaker, it is punctuated with narratives and anecdotes in response to the needs of the people, not a few, not friends, not family, the needs of the people who appointed this humble, good and faithful servant as their leader and prime minister. In there, Mr. Speaker, in words, in figures and in deeds, Mr. Speaker, good deeds that are not vindictive or malicious Respected, Mr. Speaker, and wicked, repressive and wicked. Good deeds in response to the cry of the people of this country after six years in a government that was repressive and offensive and disrespectful. Mr. Speaker, throughout the core of the budget, you can feel, see and hear the conscience response to the cause of the small and medium-sized businessmen and women. While the large and the established enterprises are assured of an enabling environment that allows them to thrive without devouring the small and the once hopeless but now hopeful and aspiring partners in the economy. The budget, Mr. Speaker, caters for all to participate, to benefit, and to evolve in a fair and enabling environment created by our humble servant. Mr. Speaker, the farmers, the teachers, fire and police officers, nurses and doctors, health workers, in general domestic workers, hospitality workers, the differently able, our social dependents, the aged and the youth, Mr. Speaker, the people of this country are being heard, they are being considered, and they are being given opportunities to partake and enjoy the fruits of thy labor. A government who cares. Well done, good and faithful servant. Mr. Speaker, the ethos of the budget demonstrates that when the people empower men and women of goodwill, compassion, determination, fortitude and sincerity, the work of the people gets done without any victimization, vindictiveness and scandals. Mr. Speaker, the people's work gets done in figures, words and in deed. Mr. Speaker, the evidence in the figures presented and articulated by the Prime Minister, Minister for Finance, 
in the various sectors of the economy, speaks for themselves and points in one direction. To a Prime Minister who is hardworking, sincere, compassionate, honest, caring, attentive, not vindictive, and one who is prudent, realistic, and understanding in his work. Mr. Speaker, permit me this opportunity to reflect on my earlier opening statements, to give meaning, significance, and to put into perspective this budget, the spirit and essence, the soul, the element and contents, and the ethos and philosophy. Mr. Speaker, the sincerity and intent of this budget isn't solely about the words crafted and uttered in the presentation of a speech by this Minister of Finance, but rather by the figures inscribed in the document called the Estimates of Revenue and Expenditure 2023-24. Expenditure That's what it is about. So when you hear all of the rhetoric about a speech wasn't disturbed, what was presented here on Tuesday, Mr. Speaker, was a motion, a motion which happens often in the Parliament, a motion which speaks to the estimates of revenue and expenditure, just like any other motion, Mr. Speaker, when any of the government minister can stand and present a motion and speak to that motion, no one has to circulate any of the notes or the document from which the presenter has made that presentation. But you see, the attitude, the culture, and the behavior of that organization now, Mr. Speaker, is to go after personalities. Yes. So they must take your words and twist it. They must use social media and try to diminish who you are, your character, and your integrity, and your philosophy, and what you stand for. It is about destroying people, destroying men and women of commitment and their family. So they need the document, Mr. Speaker, to see how they can tear into the Minister for Finance, rather than look at the book which was given to them with all of the information. With all of the information, that is where it is. Not in the words that were crafted to present the budget. So they're making a big fuss because they want to be victims. They want to be victims of not being given an opportunity to speak. They want to be victims of not having received a copy of the docu document or the presentation. But Mr. Speaker, they will learn. If they believe 26 July 2021 is anything, wait until the next time. <laughs> Wait until the next time. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I beg for your indulgence to reveal to you and this Honorable House what I discovered, not with a written copy of the Minister for Finance's speech in my hand, but by listening attentively. Some of us can't listen attentively. We don't have that span of attention. No, he doesn't listen. If he was listening, he wouldn't be where he is now. <laughs> Not with any narrative, Mr. Speaker, but by listening attentively and navigating through the pages, page by page, department by department, head by head, section by section, and reading to understand the various program details in the estimates as we are all called to do in the management of the affairs of the people's business, exercise due diligence. Mr. Speaker, I will highlight a few of those, a few significant discoveries, and they are as follows. Mr. Speaker, in the estimates, on the Head 21, Office of the Prime Minister, and I'll pose a question to the Prime Minister, which I believe, given the time, will respond to. While ex examining the estimates, 
I noticed that there was a variance, a positive vari uh, variance of $746,001 in the training vote, which on a more clinical examination appears to be funds transferred by the Ministry of Finance to the Prime Minister's office to clear some outstanding payments to a company called Ojo Labs under the National Apprenticeship Program. There is also, Mr. Speaker, there is also, Mr. Speaker, under that head, an amount of $954,800 in variance on the grants and contributions for clearing of payments to Ojo Labs in 2022-2023. Mr. Speaker, I am curious, and I hope that the Prime Minister, in his rebuttal, explains in detail, explains in detail who the people who appointed him through their representatives here in the House, the details of this subject matter. I lay this case now. <laughs> to explain... <laughs> I'm sure you understand what I'm saying. Good, thank you. However, Mr. Speaker, on the brighter side of things, on the brighter side of things, and remember I said earlier on the spirit of the budget, the ethos, the spirit, Mr. Speaker, the essence of the budget, the element, the contents, the ethos, the philosophy of the budget is all surrounding the people. All surrounding the people. And so, Mr. Speaker, let us reflect on some of my findings of this people-centric budget being undertaken by the good and faithful servant of the people. Mr. Speaker, I noticed that there was a variance of, sorry, Mr. Speaker, under this, Mr. Speaker, I notice there are a number of allocations made, Mr. Speaker, to undertake and to improve on some, undertake new initiatives and to improve on some. First one, public assistance, Mr. Speaker. Public assistance increased, is being increased this financial year by 200% an increase of $600,000. That increase, Mr. Speaker, is not for anybody out there who has interest and they've asked the government to help them pay something. That, Mr. Speaker, are for the people of this country, the poor people of this country, $600,000, an additional $600,000. Mr. Speaker, for years, this parliament, for five years, six years ago in this parliament, was blue blued into believing that there was a distress fund. Every time the matter, I was embarrassed sitting and knowing there's no distress fund. But playing games, playing games and saying there's a distress fund. Mr. It was very distressing. It was disturbing. But Mr. Speaker, guess what? The good and faithful servant, Mr. Speaker, has brought back the distress fund, and this year, and this year, an additional seven hundred thousand dollars is being put towards the distress distress fund. And you ask, what are we doing? What are we doing with the 29, what, what's, what's it, the 29 million surplus? We're not giving it to anybody who don't deserve it. Not Certainly not. But Mr. Speaker, moving on, another one which I think we probably need to hear some more about is the National Printing Corporation. Rehabilitation of building one, 1 1.8 million for operation and maintenance $244,000 and building infrastructure 735500 
we need to know something, Mr. Speaker. Because all of a sudden, the National Printing Corporation disappeared from the home on, on Jeremy Street. Then you heard talk of that building to be demolished, the courthouse to be demolished, the parliament to be de demolished. Probably today we'd have been speaking on the market steps or on the boulevard, the people's parliament. To be demolished, Mr. Speaker, with no plan as to what will happen. Custody suites, custody suites, suites demolished. So this was a demolition crew. A demolition crew. Demolition crew with yellow hats. That's what it was about. Before you know it is demolished. That's why the party will be demolished soon. So, Mr. Speaker, one, we need to hear the story of the National Printing Corporation, who was removed out of their home to find other location with a promise of great things to, be, to happen. Building a new St. Lucia. Mash up everything and build a new St. Lucia. And you tell me you want to profess to be that leader who will save this country? Yeah? You know, they have a way of calling people's, people names, you know? They tried to call me the snake. We know where the first snake went to, eh? The first one ended up on a hill. On a hill, looking down at the city. But Mr. Speaker, if it took a snake to save this country, I am indeed for it. Mr. Speaker, also on the head 42 Ministry of Commerce, we see an amount of $1 million to the supply warehouse and an increased subsidy on the grants and contributions. Where do you think that went to, Mr. Speaker? To the people. To the people. Then we move on, Mr. Speaker, and I must indicate, Mr. Speaker, I have never seen a government who has made pronouncements and have demonstrated that they're putting where their mouth is, their money where their mouth is. And what do we see happening in recent times in the last two years? We feel an energy in the society. People eager to do things for themselves. Exhibitions. People being encouraged to use their hands and fend for themselves. Not only to sit back and to wait for government to ha give them handouts, but they are, you heard the minister yesterday when he spoke. And he spoke about um, Viewfort North and the things that they're doing in Viewfort North. I want to go there to see what they're doing. Uh, and I hear what Canel and co Coco, Coco and Boapé, you know, all this kind of thing. I need to know the engineering of these kinds of delicacies because our people are being encouraged by the leaders on this side, side to get involved. And so under that head, Mr. Speaker of Commerce, there's a micro, small, and medium-sized enterprise, an amount of $8.3 million for local MSMEs to invest in or better secure financing business startup and expansion purposes. Yesterday, I was having a chat with the parliamentary rep for Sufre, and she was telling me of the positive responses so far towards that initiative of individual small business people coming in to register and to apply for, for, for the grant and loan um, program. Last night in my constituency, my people were engaged in, in, in a teleconference, a video conference in preparation, some 45 to 50 of them. And what is amazing, Mr. Speaker, that initiative in Castries North is being led by the young people young men and women who have stood up and said we want to help ourselves and later on I'll tell you what they're doing. Then you have on the miscellaneous grants and contribution an increase in the subvention to export St. Lucia to build capacity and leverage St. Lucian manufacturers. Again Mr. Speaker it's not about talk it's about action and it's a demonstration of commitment by putting our money where our mouths are. That's what it is. And also, Mr. Speaker, as you read the, 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 in, within the budget, as you read along, there's the empowerment of students and youth through various programs, some $65,000 put there for the young people. 
And, it's, and that amount, Mr. Speaker, will help them, those who are into IT and, and, and other businesses, will help them to prepare them, to empower those students with the knowledge and skills to develop and enhance innovative and creative business, businesses, business ideas. That is it, Mr. Speaker. That is what this government does, seeing about the welfare of its people, the people of this country who have for years been asking, do something for us. We need to have the support in moving forward and participating in an economy. No longer, Mr. Speaker, should we sit back, relax, and wait for people to come and say they're investing for our people and they take more than they give to our people. That's what happens. And there's some of them who come with grand ideas, sweet talk and fancy talk. By the time you look at what they're presenting to you, you believe that you have a city in Viewfort like Dubai <laughs> with 28 islands, 28, with no money in their pocket. That is not what we want to develop, Mr. Con Mr. Speaker. We want to be develop a country of individuals who are productive, who are innovative, who are prepared to put their small coins together, like Ms. Kazime, who put $350 together to get the coals, etc. We got the story yesterday. But to build on that and to move beyond the domestic economy and to export to other countries and to have the foreign exchange to build St. Lucia for ourselves. That is what this government is about. Not believing that only because of color you can walk in with an empty briefcase in your hand and you'll get everything that you want. That's not it, Mr. Speaker. And so, Mr. Speaker, let me indulge further into some more good and faithful deeds by thy good and faithful servant and by this government. Mr. Speaker, it's amazing. It's heart-wrenching when you go through those estimates and you see what's in there. On the grants and contribution, and I appeal to those opposite who probably didn't have the time to read and to understand, I appeal to them to go through the estimates on the grants and contribution and look what this government has done. This government has said we need to give assistance, we need to give a helping hand to those persons most in need. And what do we have? Farmers with disability, an initial grant of $10,000. One may say, what's $10,000? But they had nothing before. We're saying $10,000 to start with. The St. Lucia Cadet Corps, an increase in the allocation of $20,000, and the list goes on. The Junior Achievers Program, an increase of $20,000. The Nata School, an increase of $20,000. That is a government that is caring, a government that understands the plight of the people, and a government that is determined and committed to the cause that we have ahead of us, putting people first. Then you look at Special Education Center in Sufra, Mr. Speaker. And the member for Sufra has just walked in. $25,000 increase. Then you look at the Lady Gordon School, an increase of $25,000. Mr. Speaker, I'm going to spend time and run through this list because people need to know the things that we are doing for the people who are in need in this country. Not the greedy, the needy. Because many times it's the greedy ones who benefit on the other side. We are talking about and we are committed to the needy. The School for the Blind, an additional $25,000. Rise St. Lucia, $20,000. Feed the Poor, $20,000. St. Lucia Red Cross, $20,000. All of these are increases, Mr. Speaker. Increases. These are not, these are not short term grants. These are increases they are already receiving. We are saying we acknowledge the work we are doing, you are doing. We appreciate what you are doing. We appreciate your cause. Yes, of, well the National Trust, that's the biggest one. Can you imagine Mr. Speaker, in case you didn't know, can you imagine that this guy, which one? 
the one who is here. Because of your own insensitivity, your wickedness, your desire for yourself and your friends, you withdrew, you withdrew the subvention of the National Trust. Just because the National Trust, for the purpose it was established to guard the heritage of this country, to ensure that persons don't squander the heritage of this country, preserve it and protect it, and ensure that it is left to the use of the people. Because they stood their ground on the national issue, you withdrew the subvention. You withdrew the subvention? From the time it was won, they have been getting it, so you withdrew it. This government, this government has reintroduced it. $700,000 to the work of the National Trust. So John Boy, he's spinning like a fan. <laughs> Spinning like a fan. Because if Sir John was alive and this charade was going on with his party, he would have been so annoyed. You know? He would have been so annoyed. It's a path from blue. Thanks for the support. <laughs> and so, Mr. Speaker, we move on to the National Council for Disabilities, an increase of $20,000. Adelaide's home, they're already receiving ninety. Children's home in Cicero, now at Rodney Bay, 20, an additional 20. And the list goes on, the view for children's home, all of them $25,000. Marion home increased $25,000. St. Lucy's home $25,000. Mr. Speaker, this government understands that we cannot do everything on our own. We need to have those organizations support us and to help the country in those sectors that we cannot interfere with. That's what it is about. So Cornerstone. Cerebral Palsy Association, Childhood Development and Guidance Center, all of them, the Diabetic and Hypertensive Association and the St. Lucia Autistic Society, which who never received before, and today this government has decided to give them $20,000 to continue their work. Mr. Speaker, this is the government I'm speaking about, a government that is caring, a government that feels it and knows it, and responds to the call of the people, not one of, vindica of vindictiveness. Not one of vindictiveness. So, Mr. Speaker, I may come back. I may come back. But let me turn quickly to the Department of Infrastructure, Ports, Transport, and Including Energy and to scan through the estimates of expenditure for the department. We have the recurrent expenditure of 53,529,700. Capital expenditure, 117,235,500. dollars A total expenditure for the agency, 170,762,200. dollars Mr. Speaker, these estimates of expenditure are expected to meet the urgent maintenance needs of our roads and bridges and other public infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, this is very important. And I believe, Mr. Speaker, every politician who has served in government or in opposition should have a conscience of understanding the needs of the country in as far as infrastructure is concerned. But more so when you have served in government and you believe that you understand the finances, how the economy works, and managing budgets, etc., etc., to understand that there are times when you want to do everything under the sun, but it's not possible all at once. And to behave as if where you came from recently, that it, there were streets of gold and glass and marble, and all of a sudden it changed and there are potholes and it's the worst roads and so you on the air, in the media, every day, making all sorts of fun of the government. Mr. Speaker, this government is committed to maintaining our inf infrastructure. And you know it was unfortunate last year, Mr. Speaker, and you know they, they love when you make statements and speak about the importance of science, you know? the impact of climate on infrastructure, 
they make a big thing about it, science, and, and as if to ridicule. But Mr. Speaker, science dictates everything in our lives. Science, it, it, it dictates everything. And science doesn't necessarily mean all the fancy things, the simple, simplest things. The science of knowing when to fix the roads and what applications to use and how to implement it and to execute the job. And so, Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Infrastructure understands the impact of, and challenges by climate change and the increased rainfalls and the intensity of rainfalls we have received in the last year. And this year, we're not too sure what will happen. But I've already speak, spoken to the Prime Minister, the Minister for Finance, and I've said to him, one of, the, one of the actions I would like him to undertake this year is to alter the cycle of allocations to the Ministry of Infrastructure to allow us to have that money up front immediately after the passage of the budget. Because, Mr. Speaker, if you want to really take care of your infrastructure, to preserve it and to do it properly and not waste money. You have to do it in the dry season, not in the rain. Do not wait until June, July and August and then the rains come down. You ask those people in the United States who, do, who are involved in, 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 in infrastructure work or in construction, housing construction, there are certain times when they get they, they, they're building and they know when the, when the winter comes, then they are inside, they are covered and they can continue their work. So, Mr. Speaker, this St. Lucia's public infrastructure continues to be severely challenged by climate change, as I've said, and we will respond adequately. In this financial year, Mr. Speaker, it is our intention to forge ahead with ongoing critical capital projects, which include the Millennium Highway and West Coast Road project, and in addition, a greater thrust will be engendered in our pursuit to attain our goal in energy independence by pursuing geothermal exploration through the Renewable Energy Sector Development Program. Mr. Speaker, and I'll say, give a, a, I'll say something a little more later. The Millennium West Coast Highway, the Millennium Highway particularly, was constructed sometime between 1995 and 1997. Ever since, it has not received any major attention in terms of maintenance, etc. It has been a problematic road ever since. The government of the United Kingdom in, nine, in 2015, through former Prime Minister Kenny Anthony, was able to assist us with a grant of 43 million pounds to undertake the reconstruction of the Millennium Highway and the West Coast Road. It was signed in 2019 thereabout, and that project is on the way, and many of you would know I need not go again into the details of that project. We are slowly making some progress, and I'm hoping that soon the Millennium, Millennium Highway will be completed in a, in a few months, because the, the deadline date has gone, but we need to get it going. We'll complete and connect with the Japanese um, finance bridge, and then for the balance of the work. Mr. William, Mr. Speaker, that project would start from the cul-de-sac bridge. Um, is costing some 43 million US dollars. The project, Mr. Speaker, transcends three administrations, as I said. Originally negotiated in 2015 by former Prime Minister and Minister for VFO South on behalf of CARICOM member countries, of which St. Lucia is a part of, commenced during the last administration, of which I was the Minister for Infrastructure, and now being completed by this administration, of which the Prime Minister was then Minister for Infrastructure in 2015. Three administrations. And I recall, Mr. Speaker, I had to really put some extra effort to make sure that we continued with this project because I felt we could not have let it down at the time. Mr. Speaker, the objectives of this project is to reconstruct and improve the condition of the Millennium Highway, or comprising 6.2 kilometers. 
Then you have 24.6 kilometers West Coast Road, primary road network, ancillary to Columbet in Soufre. And that includes, that includes a new bridge in ancillary. It will also significantly increase the level of road safety associated with this roadway, for which a comprehensive road safety program has been prepared and will be instituted. Mr. Speaker, so far on this seg segment of the road, what we call lot, lot two, a contractor has been appointed and we are hoping that construction, in fact, there has been a timeline, a schedule given for construction to commence in the months of April and May. The contractor which has been, who won the bid for that component of the road is a Trinidadian firm of a, much experience and they will be doing lot two and three, which is cul-de-sac to ancillary and ancillary to Columbia. And a local contractor will be doing the ancillary, the ancillary bridge. This, Mr. Speaker, I hope will bring this project in time and to completion within, within budget. As I said, Mr. Speaker, the reconstruction of the bridge um, in cul-de-sac, that bridge, Mr. Speaker, is ready. The Japanese built the bridge, Mr. Speaker. The bridge, its design is intended to improve the hydraulics of the cul-de-sac river to allow for greater flow within the basin and to eliminate the paralysis which is caused any time you've got any extreme weather condition with heavy rainfall, where economically and socially the country is paralyzed once you live south of the Mon or east of the Badlil. That bridge, Mr. Speaker, hopefully by the design and the retraining of the river which will come through with the building of berms, etc., that, that cul-de-sac basin, Mr. Speaker, is likely to resolve that cul-de-sac bridge and the works to be done is likely to resolve the issues experienced in the cul-de-sac region. Mr. Speaker, a number of our members over the last two days rose and certainly presented themselves requesting roads to be fixed. And I interface with them on a daily basis. I see the member for Denry North raising his hands and I guess he's trying to touch Austin Hill, wherever it is. <laughs> but we respond. <clears throat> and we respond, you know, within, with the understanding that we have a commitment. <clears throat> a commitment to serve, a commitment to deliver, a commitment to respond to the people. And even sometimes, Mr. Speaker, you know the beautiful thing about this government, and I must admit, I must admit without reservation, it's the passion, the commitment, and the love that exists among members who show understanding, who are all re ready to assist and who show compassion. Mr. Speaker, that is encouraging. And even when I say to them, boy, we don't have much, you know, we, and I'm trying to sometimes, you know, protect the Prime Minister, because I understand what it is to, prime, to be Prime Minister. When you have minister after minister coming and saying that their program is the most important program for the government, and he has to balance that budget and to make a decision to satisfy everybody. So uh, sometimes I try to protect the Prime Minister because I know what it is to manage a fiscal. You know, I know what it is. But Mr. Speaker, we have put together a program for this year based on the resources which has been made available to us. And the program includes works comprising slope stabilization, reconstruction and rehabilitation of roads, bridges and culverts, and certainly what we call water cost maintenance, which is what used to be called the silting. And I'm happy we have, we have, we have termed it water cost maintenance, 
Because many times, you know, there are people who believe that there's some magic about the Silton. And I'm not too sure who, who seemed to have planted that, that, that seed in making people believe the Silton is about making money. So as soon as rain falls down, you show your face on the side, and then you call an excavator and you desil. You're making money. <laughs> it's known for that. So, Mr. Speaker, this here, water cost maintenance, there is an allocation of $4 million, and it will ju not just include going in and desilting the river. Because actually, rivers are not really supposed to be desilting, because you dis, you dis and, and I'm sure the member for Denry South will speak eloquently on this matter, in that you don't go and destroy the ecosystem. You don't destroy the, 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 the velocity, what you call the, um, the velocity of, of uh, and the river ecology. You don't go and destroy that. The hydraulics of the river you need to maintain. Because as you desilt, Mr. Speaker, what you do, you give, you give that river a greater flow and a capacity that is intensified. Hence the reason sometimes we have so much flooding in the lower plains. If you're able to return that, that compounded, Mr. Speaker, with the development that is taking place in the hillside of rooftops, the number of rooftops coming in, and there's no rainwater harvesting, etc., etc. And that is an area we need to discuss, um, Minister for Agriculture. In terms of coming with a kind of symbiosis, symbiotic relationship that will look at rainwater harvesting, the whole question of management of the watershed, the river banks, and being able to, to manage the river banks and for infrastructure to be able to do the little that we can do to improve on our rivers. So $4 million, Mr. Speaker, and very soon we will be looking at the respective areas um, to respond to the Silton. We have in zone, and we have a schedule of the eight zones um, well, it's more, eight, it's more um, 10 than 8 because you have in zone 8 alone, you have zone A, B, and C. So we have a program already scheduled. And so if the Prime Minister delivers to the Ministry of Infrastructure as he delivered to the parliamentary representative for Babano, we should be able to start very soon. <laughs> we should be able to start very soon, Mr. Speaker. We have also, Mr. Speaker, slope stabilization, and we have ongoing works of the reconstruction of the retaining wall near the streams of Power Church, a very treacherous um, 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 landslide there. That work is going on. We have work to, to do at Mont retaining wall reconstruction, then Olion retaining wall, and uh, retaining walls in a number of zones from one to eight, totaling $2.5 million. Also, Mr. Speaker, reconstruction and rehabilitation, meaning potholing and maintenance of roads, etc., etc., which is very important. It is really important for us to maintain those roads. We have to do some other works in Forkani Wall. We have the Union River Wall. We have bodily slope stabilization. Queens Lane Road Rehabilitation, we have some retention for there, and also we have work to be done at Austin Hill. On, well, that's not on the um, rehabilitation, that's reconstruction. Then you have new works um, along the East Coast Highway, Mr. Speaker. Some $2 million will be spent on the East Coast Highway. And what the East Coast Highway calls for at this time is proper management until our resources are available for reconstruction. So while we focus on the West Coast to reconstruct the West Coast, we need to maintain the East Coast properly to make sure that we preempt any, um, any kind of deterioration of the carriageway. So some $2 million will, um, has been allocated, Mr. Speaker, to deal with the West Coast Highway. Also, Mr. Speaker, we, the East Coast Highway, sorry. Also, Mr. Speaker, we have roads requiring intervention in various zones as prioritized. $1.125 million has been put aside. In Cul-de-Sac, we spoke about outstanding works the, in VG Culvert, Shock Bridge. Shock Bridge, for those of us who are, who are um, observant, as you drive the Shock Bridge, Mr. Speaker, you notice there's a dip. 
So what 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 has happened on Member for Castries North, you have ten minutes left. I need half an hour. Member for Denry North. Mr. Speaker, I want to invoke standing order 4210 in order to allow the member for Castries North an additional hour within which to complete his presentation. Honourable members, the question is that standing order 3210 be invoked to allow the member for Castries North an additional one hour in which to complete his presentation. I now put the question, as many as of that opinion say aye, aye. as many as of a country opinion say no, I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it, leave is granted. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank members for their graciousness. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, so while the allocation of these estimates are not meant to undertake major projects, Mr. Speaker, we are mindful of the need to fix those bridges. And as I said, the shock bridge is one, for those of you who are observant, there is a dip as you drive along uh, on the shock bridge, which really is an old, um, an old um, failed culvert. Well, not failed, but failing culvert ever since Hurricane Thomas when it, it occurred. Work was done, but I think the stress of that bridge now is calling for a new bridge, and uh, work will be done to preserve what is existing now, because what has happened, the AMCO pipes, as we call them, have sort of um, sunk a bit, and the, the engineers believe that we can um, strengthen the, the, the floor of the, of, of the bridge, or the, the, the ceiling of the AMCO pipes, by putting in sec sections of, of, of new AMCO, which will hold on for a little while. So that work will continue, Mr. Speaker. We also have got um, some work to do on the Trumasu Bridge, the Poilin Bridge, the Poilin Main Bridge, which um, has been given a little um, um, problem over the years. We have seen some action taking place there. So based on our road maintenance management system unit, they have been able to detect that bridge as a bridge that needs um, pre um, um, intervention ahead of any calamity. You've got, Mr. Speaker, the Denry Main Bridge, the Boskidor Bridge, Black Bay Bridge. All of these bridges, Mr. Speaker, will receive some maintenance um, work just to ensure that we preempt anything that is likely to happen. Mr. Speaker, I spoke of some of the other areas. I've spoken about the slope stabilization, the bridges and culverts, Austin Hill, Mr. Speaker, work has started. Uh, uh, um, $750,000 has been allocated to meet the cost of this much needed rehabilitation of, um, of that bridge. And I'm sure the member for Denry North is quite happy um, because a commitment has been made and work um, certainly will be done on that bridge. Then you have the rehabilitation of roads, which I've spoken about, the desilting of rivers. As we said, it's, um, it's water cost maintenance of $4 million. The maintenance of gov government buildings, Mr. Speaker. That, that, Mr. Speaker, is one which needs, going forward, some serious consideration. Many of our government buildings, Mr. Speaker, these are the buildings maintained by the Department of Infrastructure are under stress. Some of them are old, more than 50 years. There are those who have been around since the fire. And it's not that the integrity of the building is bad. It is the maintenance of the building. That routine maintenance to keep those buildings looking good and dealing with whatever stresses that may come about and to ensure you extend the life of the building. 
Mr. Speaker, $1.68 million, which is the normal um, allocation given. I am hoping that uh, next year we can increase that so that we can have some pre preemptive measures taken, preventative measures and preemptive measures taken to avoid what we see the decay that is happening, Mr. Speaker. This, Mr. Speaker, will allow the government to move away from renting property and spending millions and millions and millions of dollars in rental of property. As we speak, Mr. Speaker, the government is attempting to decipher a commitment to the Dire Mall, okay, to deal with it because of the further strain it will put on the government's pulse, Mr. Speaker. We need to look at the assets that we own, attempt to rehabilitate them, and maintain them, and we can continue to occupy those buildings. This building, Mr. Speaker, we are in, when it was mentioned that it would be destructed, it would be demolished, when the engineers came, the report said that this building is structurally sound. The integrity is good, structurally sound. When the health and safety people came in, they said all the building needs is continuous maintenance. There's nothing wrong. I, I can present the report one of these days. So if we do this to all of our buildings, Mr. Speaker, put in the resources, invest in the maintenance of the buildings, make sure there is a regime of maintenance, a routine maintenance program. We can preserve the building. It's about the health of the building. Buildings are, are like ourselves. If we don't maintain ourselves, we'll fall down one day. But if you maintain, maintain the buildings, they'll stand up. They'll stand up. The other thing, Mr. Speaker, the issue of mold. I have mandated the Ministry, Mr. Speaker, to look into this business of mold. We are running away from mold, Mr. Speaker. But as we run, we are carrying mold with us. We are taking mold from one building to the next, in the books, in the, in the documentation, in the furniture. As you move, you carry the mold with you. So we now, Mr. Speaker, in the Ministry of Infrastructure, Department of Infrastructure, I have mandated them to conduct a, an exercise to develop a plan of action, a scientific plan of addressing the issue of mold so that we can address it in a, an informed manner. That, Mr. Speaker, we are committed to do. And then, Mr. Speaker, the caretaker maintenance program, of which uh, $1.6 million has been allocated. This, Mr. Speaker, is good. This will allow us to continue to maintain our roadsides and the environment, et cetera, et cetera. But I still believe, Mr. Speaker, we need, as a tourism destination, we need to invest some more money into maintaining our environment. We definitely need to do this. We cannot do it um, sporadically. We have to do it systematically. It has to be routine so that we manicure our environment. We plant the flowers, we beautify, we clean the vegetation, we trim our trees, we open up the vistas of, of, our, of, of the sea and the, and the environment so that people who come will find it encouraging and attractive to, to navigate around, around the landscape of our country. When a tourist lands in this country, Mr. Speaker, in VFO, our environment should engage them. Our environment should engage them. They should be speaking to the environment, not realizing they're spending an hour and a half on the road. Okay? That is the kind of thing we need to do, Mr. Speaker. Also, Mr. Speaker, yes, we have to do it. We have to encourage it. We have to take the lead on this matter. Also, Mr. Speaker, and we can do it constituency by constituency. Also, Mr. Speaker, in these estimates, the National Utilities Regulatory Commission which was established to regulate utilities, water, and electricity particularly, that organization has been operating for some time. And every year, because of the fact, Mr. Speaker, at this time, the only utility that seemed to be under the rubric of the National Utilities Regulatory Commission, the NOC, is WASCO. So the revenue from WASCO as its contribution towards the operations of the NUC is not sufficient to manage the NUC. 
is not sufficient to give it the leadership that it needs, along with the supporting staff, technical staff, to undertake the work of the NUC, plus the training that is required. It's not any ordinary organization where you can put anybody in there. The members of the NUC, those who are on the board of the NUC, those members, those members, Mr. Speaker, are called to train every year. Every year, those members have to attend training at, with POC to understand the regulatory system so that the decisions are informed decisions and not decisions that are taken based on emotion. That is why, Mr. Speaker, the NUC, according to the legislation, is structured to ensure that it is not politicized, that you don't keep changing it every time a government comes in, but it is preserved. But we know what happened the last time, and I'm proud that on this occasion, Mr. Speaker, the NUC has continued, and we have been able to strengthen it. However, Mr. Speaker, because of the work which we have done in as far as the, the um, renewable energy sector, we are now on the home stretch as far as the um, legislation is concerned, the new Electricity Act. The Act has been drafted and it has gone through much discussion and next week thereabout we will commence some consultations first with the technical team. That these are further consultations of course as we go down the home stretch with the NUC, the energy unit, the Department of Infrastructure, with LUSLEC and other interested parties. The commencement of the discussions will, 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 will move on. Continuation, rather, of the discussions will commence, and then in preparation to have final public consultations before the, the legislative draft bill is brought to Parliament and for passage um, into law. Mr. Speaker, I'm very excited. I have one, one colleague of mine who keeps harassing me in a good way, a positive harassment, not negative harassment, the parliamentary rep for Soufre, who <laughs> constantly speaks to me about the activities of the energy unit and the time for us to get this bill um, through, which will allow the environment to be, to be um, opened up to, to demonopolize to a certain extent, if you want to use that term, to demonopolize the, the environment, to allow businesses to get involved, to be able to produce their own energy, whether it's through solar, the sun, whether it's through wind, or even rain or, or water, the sea, wind tech um, and ocean tech, all of these, Mr. Speaker, are possibilities and opportunities for the business community. And we have some business people this, in this country, Mr. Speaker, who are very excited about it and who are ready to move. In fact, they're ready to bolt. But we have been holding them back for the last few years. We've got some, one or two of our large companies. You have the Winward and Leeward Brewery, who have got a plan moving into um, renewable energy. Uh, the, you have the Ferenc Dairy. They are very much ahead. KFC. A number of those companies, Mr. Speaker, are all in, are all on the block, ready to take off to participate in the new renewable energy um, program under the new, under the new um, <clears throat> electricity, electricity act. Also, Mr. Speaker, not too long ago we launched the renewable energy sector development program, which is really the geothermal program. And this is, in my view, the first, second, third, maybe fourth um, phase of a program which started as far back as the 70s, when the first well was drilled at the Sulphur Springs, all the way then, in an attempt to see whether there is an opportunity and there is capacity to generate electricity out of geothermal. That exercise, Mr. Speaker, wasn't a failed exercise, but it didn't get the answers that we thought that was necessary to continue to explore. In fact, in some instances, even the, dr the drilling equipment was compromised. 
And so later on, we then went ahead, the government of St. Lucia then went ahead and continued the program. And after those um, sort of preliminary um, investigations, there seemed to be signs of greater capacity and, and, and intensity of what exists beneath the ground. Mr. Speaker, with the advent of new equipment and, and the, the advan advancement of technology, there is the opportunity now for slim hole drilling, which will not necessarily cause much destruction and which doesn't have to be done in the area where the steam is coming from. So whereas in the minds of many people that the steam and the capacity we're looking at is down below the sulfur springs, it doesn't necessarily mean that's where you have to drill. And probably the vein beneath the surface is in a location that is far from the actual sulfur springs. And so we have demarcated, Mr. Speaker, an area which in the policy statement I'll give greater detail, an area which includes parts of Saltibus and, um, and other areas for Saint-Jacques and other areas within the Soufra region, some of which we have to ensure that we do not encroach on the Piton management um, site and that we are very conscious of. We are hoping, Mr. Speaker, with this we will see an improvement, one, in the ability to generate electricity away from fossil fuels, an opportunity to allow independent power producers to produce for themselves and to also feed into the grid and to be able to not just serve themselves but to be able to sell back to the electricity company and to be able to see this as a profitable, profitable business. Mr. Speaker, in all of this, one of the things that we are careful about and must ensure that we protect is that while we speak about renewable energy and energy independence, we have to also remind ourselves that there is always a need to have a fallback mechanism. And the fallback mechanism is your ability in case of anything, in case we have, as someone said to me the other day, that she was told that we will have seven days of darkness. And if ever that happens, Mr. Speaker, in this country of seven days of darkness, and we were to move away from fossil fuel entirely into solar, then we totally will be totally dark. So we have to have an approach that allows a balance, that allows the public to generate, generate its own electricity, but at the same time to know that there is a resource we can fall back on, but that resource must be maintained. And so in the regime that we put in place, Mr. Speaker, in the billing system, the licensing system, and the level of investment, while we want to increase the, 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 the production capacity at, at the domestic level as to what you can produce at your home, on your rooftop, 5 kilowatts, and in the commercial sector, 25 kilowatts, we are hoping that this will increase, obviously, to allow for the industrial sector and the commercial sector to produce more than 25 kilowatts, and to allow persons in the domestic environment to be able to produce a little more, so that their contribution to their electricity bill can offset quite a bit, and to save some money in moving forward. Mr. Speaker, these are some of the major issues as far as the infrastructure is concerned, as far as the estimates of expenditure. I will elaborate, Mr. Speaker, on more policy matters when we speak at the next debate. Policy matters in terms of how do we see infrastructure moving forward. And I can announce here, Mr. Speaker, this year we will be launching what I call the infrastructure plan which is called Infrastructure 2030. And what that is in a nutshell, Mr. Speaker, is really um, looking ahead, way down the road, to ask ourselves, what will we need in our infrastructure environment? What, what sort of infrastructure that we'll need? Not just roads and bridges and culverts and drains, etc., etc., and responding after the fact to land slippage and all the rest of it. But what will we need? What infrastructure do we need to underpin tourism? What infrastructure do we need to underpin health and education and the other sectors, manufacturing? What sort of infrastructure in, 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 in public utilities, electricity, water, telecommunications? All of these 
com uh, all of these comprise the environment of infrastructure to enable the economy to be able to move on and to be able to produce and to see the growth of this country in a meaningful way. And Infrastructure 2030 will look at all of those things in water, electricity, telephone, telecommunications, IT, etc., and to begin to put a plan together that will say, this is where we are likely to go. And one example of this, Mr. Speaker, we have been speaking about a road called the North-South Link Road from Rosalie to Denry. To expedite and to intensify the, the, the movement of people from Grosley to, um, to Viewfort. But again, Mr. Speaker, we need to. Yes, Mr. Speaker? No, no. Oh, I saw your lights on, Mr. Speaker. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> I'm taking your role. So we need to decide, Mr. Speaker, to understand. We have to understand if that road is built, Mr. Speaker, what is the infrastructure? What will be the infrastructure necessary? in terms of roads, in terms of sewer, in terms of, 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 of electricity, telecommunications, what sort of businesses will be there. So this, Mr. Speaker, will allow the government to plan and also will allow the private sector to plan and certainly will be an attraction to investors who will want to come to St. Lucia knowing that we have a plan for infrastructure and so they can bring in their businesses into the country and the infrastructure of the country will be able to maintain them. Now, Mr. Speaker, I want to move quickly into my constituency or to the constituency of Castries North and to speak on a few, a few issues or a few um, initiatives that we believe will help the constituency move forward. Mr. Speaker, um, for some time now, I have been speaking about the, nece the, ne the necessity for Castries North to begin to look inwardly and to see what we can do with the capacity that we have in the constituency. As we speak, Mr. Speaker, the intention is to bring to fruition um, incomplete, ongoing, and new initiatives throughout the constituency that will further bolster the constituency towards attaining the full status of a municipality. And this is not, this is not to mean that we are ceding from anything. We believe that Castries North has the environment, the social and economic environment, to be able to be declared as a borough, if we want to go down that way. And I think it's, in a, it's, it's, it's timely at this time, because we're looking at the whole issue of the review, review of the Local Government Authorities Act, whether we're going to a borough or whether we're going to go to a local authority. To be able to collect our taxes, to be able to maintain our infrastructure, to be able to maintain our, um, our environment, and to be able to keep the constituency in a way that we are proud of. I believe the Castries Constituency Council has been doing a good job. They have been certainly helping out in many ways. But you know, the people of Castries North, Mr. Speaker, think of themselves as being independent people that they want to do for themselves. They don't want to go through conduits to get to the, to, to the next stop. They want to do for themselves. And so we believe, Mr. Speaker, that this year will be a year when we will be advocating the need for us to look at Castries North and to see how we can work with the local government authority and to determine, like every other constituency, so we're not, we're not rebels or renegades, we are trying to get that status like every other constituency, Miku North and Denry South and Sufre and the others. We want to be able to manage our own affairs and to do it well. So hopefully, Mr. Speaker, we'll be able to, we'll, we'll get to there. There are a number of incomplete projects, Mr. Mr. Speaker, in Castries North that we need to complete and we're hoping we can continue. There are a number of them we were able to address in the last financial year and, and the one before. Um, in BZ, for example, Mr. Speaker, for some time now, we have been looking at the completion, or rather the um, completion of a multipurpose court and the BZ Walk Children's Playground, which was done some years ago and got destroyed. We want to now get back there and to get it done for the community. We're also hoping that we'll find some land. I cannot promise that we'll do it this year. That's land for the construction 
of an HRDC in that area. Uh, if not, I may have to speak to the Minister for Investment, who has some properties in that area, and hope that he can make one of those properties available to the community of Bize to be transformed into an HRDC. And if that is done, Mr. Speaker, we have started some collaboration with um, one of our prominent um, sons of the country who are involved in theater, etc., etc. And so not only will we be able to, one, capitalize on the existing NSDC, which we welcome and we hope will stay in Castries North, but we'll be able to give them a place to meet, a place to have discussions, and a place to be able to get engaged in creative activity, be it in theater or otherwise. Mr. Speaker, for some time now we have been speaking about the Coyote Park. We've come a long way with that park. It's a beautiful park, and we welcome the many who come from outside to use the park um, once they don't interfere with the environment and don't interfere with the community. I see one of my constituents sitting in the gallery, and he knows what I'm talking about because he's not just next door. So we will this year, Mr. Speaker, attempt to complete the park, and I must thank the Minister for Investment who has expressed an interest in assisting us one way or the other um, to see whether we can complete this, this facility. He said, Senior Minister, you need to finish this facility, and I welcome this, and I'm hoping that with CDP and, of course, his support will be able to do the little things which I'm, I'm anticipating. I've, I've requested the final costing so that we can complete it. We have already uh, received a new children's play, play set for the, for, the, for the park. In fact, we ordered it and didn't realize it was such a big, um, big um, bit of equipment. In fact, when it is installed, I suspect it's going to be the biggest on the island because what we have there now, the space is not, not adequate. We have to try and um, facilitate the um, implementation of that, um, that facility. So we'll proceed, Mr. Speaker, this year to do this. Um, we are to now put in the, the lighting system on, that, on the court next door and uh, to look at the other amenities to complete this project and hopefully to have a nice grand opening at some stage. The Minister for Investment Tourism has asked me to consider uh, the return of jazz at Kyrily, and I'm seriously thinking of it, no matter what it is, to do something and to have the jazz at Kyrily. And I've already advised the chairman of the, pro the, the proposed chairman, the one who I've identified who will head the committee, to, um, for us to speak and to discuss it and to get others engaged in the, the initiative. In Agard, Mr. Speaker, and I must say something, Mr. Speaker, the sports ground at Agard, and, you know, Castries North, and that, that is to underscore the point I made early on about the independence of Castries North. All of the sports facilities in Castries North, Mr. Speaker, were developed almost without the support of the Department of Youth and Sports. Almost without. And it's not about this current minister, it's about from times. When I got into, into, into office, Mr. Speaker, in 1987, the only existing sports facility in Castries North was the Leclerc playing field. That was it. Nowhere else. We have been able to find little locations and to put in little facilities. Agard is one of those we found. We have virtually bought people's private property who were about to construct homes and built a, a, a small playing field. In Bwapatat, we did the same thing. We built a small, a small playing field. We're looking at, as I said, BZ earlier on. Um, we did something. Carely, we did what we had to do. In, in Chase Gardens, the same thing happened, acquired land and did this. All of these were done, Mr. Speaker, almost single-handedly, um, uh, using the support of private, private sector and others who came forward, the Taiwanese particularly, to help us in that regard. And so Agad, Mr. Speaker, will now be going into the third phase of development. The first phase was to cut the land and develop it. The second phase was to redo the surface and put the lights as we have had. And now, the, the, rather the third phase now, is to implement the fencing and retain instructors to secure and protect the facility. One thing I must indicate, Mr. Speaker, that if you want to have a, 
If you, any sporting event at, at, at Agas, Mr. Speaker, the whole community comes out. The whole community. Le Clary, which is really who used to be the mecca of football, the VBCC and all the rest of it, the institution of clubs in St. Lucia, the only club with its own building. It owns the building. There's no other club in this country who owns it, have its own um, clubhouse. Le Clary has its own clubhouse, its own court, the playing field right there. The mecca of football and cricket, uh, Mr. Speaker. Stan Phillip, outstanding footballer, Mr. Speaker. You have a very positive Le Clary Football League, but when you have football, you have tournaments going up, you don't see the crowds that you, that you used to see in, in the past. Agard, you see them coming out and facilitating. In, in Boapatat, they come out and, and they're there and um, participating. So we will fence the Agard um, playing field, the Agard um, playing field, the Leclerc playing field, of course, Mr. Speaker, the, the upgrade project. We're going into phase three. We have done the fencing. Um, we have done the surface. We have, we have put in some lights. Some of it has, has uh, the lights have, have been failing. And the Minister for Sports has indicated that he is committed to putting in a new set of lights for that, that facility, the Clare playing field, to match the others. I won't be able to match the Denry South facility. They have state of the art. And I'm not too sure which other was, but certainly we're trying to see what we can do. The Chase Gardens multipurpose um, court, Mr. Speaker, the refurbishment, it's, uh, to a certain extent, the, the second phase has been completed with new lighting systems. Um, and we are hoping, Mr. Speaker, that um, we will now go to the next phase and to look at the improvement of the seating accommodation change room and of course redoing the surface by putting in some rubberized surface. The Bapatat Multipurpose Court, Mr. Speaker, was implemented one year ago, that is the upgrade, or rather I should say the improvement, a year ago, and um, this year phase two will con be considered to include upgrade to the playing surface, installation of basketball, backboards, netball goals, small goals, seating, and washroom facilities. In addition, Mr. Speaker, the government has just concluded the acquisition of a property next to the Bapatat uh, multipurpose um, facility, and that is for the construction of a long-awaited uh, center. Uh, consultations will commence very soon with the community so as to determine the design concept and, of course, um, the, the outfit of the facility that will be established in that area. Mr. Speaker, there is one community that I owe, um, I owe, and that is for the construction of an HRDC, and that is Sunbuilt. As far back as 2011, a promise was made to the community to build a, an HRDC. It's a difficult location based on the topography of the land. We looked at a number of areas, and finally, some time ago, um, we came up with a design, though accepted on second thought, I, w I went against it because what was being proposed was to build a facility again because of the terrain to have the, um, the um, center, the hall, um, downstairs and the court on the upstairs. Those have never, those don't work well, they leak. Um, we have not mastered the art of building concrete roofs to the extent of being able to withstand the pressure of our young men jumping and running on those facilities. So we have now, we have now entered into negotiations, Mr. Speaker, with the sisters of Clooney, the nuns of St. Joseph's Convent, who own some property not too far away. And we're having a good discussion, and I believe we're arriving at some kind of compromise of one taking over the lower court of the convent, which is on the main road, taking that over for, as a public court, and uh, developing a new court, which they have started promoting and raising funds, and we have committed $100,000 to them, to build that, um, that netball court or, and basketball court on the upper level, closer to the field, that, is, uh, that has greater security. And that project will start this year. And um, the administrators have already agreed to relinquishing the lower court for the community so as to have the, uh, and I speak of, of, of that court because Cedars and Sunbuilt are close by, so the lower court will be for, for Cedars and the upper, the upper court will be with the HRDC will be for, um, for Sunbuilt. 
We also have coming up, Mr. Speaker, land already identified for a children's playground in Armandale. They call it Armandale Cove, above Union Forestry. We also have uh, the La Clary Children's Playground, hopefully, to come. We're looking now, Mr. Speaker, with a greater project. We're looking at um, probably converting the La Clary Square eventually into a children's playground, uh, with the hope that we will have a suburban business center to be established in the old La Clary CDC area. It is a kind, it is what I call a business center, that an intermediary business center, which means that it will circumvent the need to either go into the congested city or to face the traffic along the Cassius Grosley Highway to go to Rodney Bay for business. It is necessary at this time, Mr. Speaker, and the purpose for which I personally decided that we should not proceed with housing where the houses were formerly is because the Clary as the main center of Castries North, the main center of business, over the years has been surrounded with development taking place. One of the biggest developments in Castries North is the Carly, the housing development, over 700 lots. No facilities, no commercial activity. We had to find a really squeeze in to get um, recreational activity. Then you have your Hillcrest Gardens, you have Greenview. There's a new development taking place near Greenview that is along the Mondidor Balata Road. You have A Garden, all those communities, Bapatat, Mondidor, densely populated areas, Mr. Speaker, and no commercial, social, or recreational, proper recreational activities. Mr. Speaker, with the proposed town center or business center, as we call it, the intention is to provide shopping, recreational, and social amenities for the people of Castries North and those who will visit. This, Mr. Speaker, we hope to use as a catalyst to then declare the surrounding areas as a special development area so that persons now who live in that general area from you take the, the, the Patricia D. James Secondary School going all the way back into Lansfield. If that area is developed as a special development area, Mr. Speaker, and we can offer, under, the, under the, 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 the legislation, offer the benefits of incentives to persons who have property in that area, who may want to go into the business of Airbnb and hotel accommodation, the hillside plazas, etc., Mr. Speaker. Being a distance away, a stone throw away, Mr. Speaker, from the George F. L. Charles Airport and the beach, this community, Mr. Speaker, will then begin to flourish as a place for business, a place for holidaying, a place for visiting, a place to be accommodated and to feel safe in that community. This, Mr. Speaker, is the plan that we are looking at. Again, Mr. Speaker, I keep mentioning the dear Minister for Investment because He's very passionate about these, these sort of projects. And he has been, Mr. Speaker, working, um, has committed himself to assisting in finding um, an investor, I believe. I don't want to make any announcements here, but we have someone on the, uh, on the horizon who is prepared to look at that, the Leclerc Business Center, Town Center, along with, again, I'll give some more information, proposed bus terminals in the city of Castries, one in the north and one in the south, to decongest our streets with all of those buses who park on the street side, providing um, a very critical service to our people. One other area, Mr. Speaker, that we're looking at is the question of the shock, VG Shock Beach Facilities and Management Plan, and that is about managing the VG Beach, the coastline, and the environment, and replenishing the beach, because VG Beach now has become probably the most popular beach. It has probably taken over for the tourists, it has probably taken over from the Ridgery Beach, which is our finest beach in the country. But because of the congestion on our roads, and before we, um, by the time we get sorted out with what we're doing on our roads with the Kuwaitis and the discussions that we're having for the construction of a, a, a falling highway, it is not beneficial either to the tourists or those who take them there to navigate that traffic 
to get to the beach and then to come back in time to get onto the cruise. So a lot of activity takes place at VG Beach. There are a lot of tourists during the season who go there, they love the beach. And so we need to put some management in place to do a number of things. Management in terms of business activity, what takes place there, how can we develop the, 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 the beach without compromising it or even compromising um, its close proximity to the airport and changing its character. We want to preserve the character. We want to make sure that we can do some beach replenishment and I've been speaking already to marine engineers, established marine engineers who believe that we can do some good work out there to replenish the beach and to reinstate the coral of, of, the, of, the, of the shop coast. There's quite a bit of coral in that area, Mr. Speaker. Some of it is really dead and it calls now back to water. It calls now for also a look at the shock river which dumps into the shock bay the Laquery River, the Bizet, and all of those rivers who dump in there, and to begin to talk about the management of those rivers in terms of pollution, garbage, etc., which can compromise the quality of the water. That, Mr. Speaker, in the hope is to put in a management authority that will look at all of those things and, and implement it. We do have one project we need to do, the Shock Beach Facilities, which is the old beach facilities that we need to redevelop and to more or less along the same <clears throat> concept as what exists outside the airport, airport entrance. We are negotiating. We do have one of our hotels in the area close by, and they too, Mr. Speaker, have some plans which they would like to look at and to discuss with us in the community. Um, Castries North, Mr. Speaker, has a music and arts project which has started in, in the community and it is certainly um, beginning to develop. It is based at the Chase Gardens Multipurpose Center, the HRDC, and that is doing well. And I'm very proud of the work so far, and quite a few young people are participating in that program. Mr. Speaker, the young people of Castries North. Last year, around this time, I think it was rather May, rather, it was May or, or April, there's a group of young people in Castries North who undertook a youth expo. And they were able to attract some 28 or 30 young people involved in a number of different products, engaging the production of a number of products. From sea moss to sea pops, as we call it, it's really ch cheesecake on a pop, um, to a range of businesses, handicraft and, and jewelry. And, uh, and these sort of things, baking, pastry making, and all, all of this sort of stuff. Certainly young people who are keen about getting into the economy, and at this time as we speak, Mr. Speaker, they have, there's a buzz going around, a buzz about the youth economy and getting involved, and they are already getting, uh, approaching the agency for consideration. They, Mr. Speaker, have, developed um, a, what I call an institute called the Castries North Youth Entrepreneurship Institute. And the intention here is to mirror what I believe your, your small business development agency, that's what you call it, SEDU, is doing to partner with them, but to do what I call the pre screening of young people wanting to get into business based on your terms, based on the ministry's terms and conditions and their standards. They have set up this, this organization and under the CDP, um, I'll be given, um, some seed money will be given to them so that they can institutionalize their operations to operate as a full-fledged entity working in the interest of the young people of the, of, of the constituency, but also extending a hand to the elders who themselves are in business. And that is in keeping with the, the mantra that the children shall lead. So Mr. Speaker, these are some of the initiatives within the constituency. I must admit that in recent times, what I've seen on the part of this government is the social commitment. The social commitment to help. The assistance with school books, the assistance with vouchers uh, for underprivileged children, the assistance 
with um, housing to, to help repair homes, the Kudme program, in, in the book again, a range of areas where the government has demonstrated a strong commitment to social assistance and social development. And I recall Mr. Speaker speaking to, not too long ago, one of, our, one of the region's prime ministers who said to me, St. Lucia now has the most attractive social program in the region. St. Lucia has one of the most attractive programs in the region in terms of the different products of social assistance, social development. And I sometimes believe, Mr. Speaker, that, you know, some of those programs are overlapping each other. And maybe there's need to be able to look at it and to streamline it to make sure that it reaches everybody, regardless of color, class, creed, or political affiliation, to ensure that the people at all times will benefit from the, will benefit from the efforts of the government. And so, Mr. Speaker, this ends my contribution on the work of the constituency. It ends my contribution on the issue of on the issue of infrastructure. And since I have a few minutes, maybe 10 or 15, I just want to touch one area which is quite important. A lot more than that. Well, thank you. I need. Oh, okay. I want to touch on the area of physical development and urban renewal, Mr. Speaker. In the budget, Mr. Speaker, under Head 5410050, is the allocation of $4 million for land acquisition. Mr. Speaker, this is an issue that is somewhat vexing, and it's one that I believe we need to address. While government has the authority, Mr. Speaker, to acquire lands, regardless of who owns the land, I do not believe it is fair to acquire land and for those lands to be in abeyance, to be negotiating, and one, when an agreement is arrived at, then it takes six, seven, eight, nine, ten years to settle. We do have a number of cases, Mr. Speaker, in which lands were taken or acquired from private owners. I know of one in the north of the country. And the interest rate of 6%, Mr. Speaker, has driven up, has driven up the claim to over $2 million and more and counting. We need to find a way of resolving this. And so this year, Mr. Speaker, the $4 million will certainly help in resolving and paying off a number of um, private owners, particularly the small people. The small people whose lands were taken and we have a few thousand dollars for. We have started the process, and I must thank the Minister for Finance for the, I don't want to say his generosity, but his understanding of the need to address the situation. And this year, we were able to clear quite a bit of that debt addressing the small individuals whose lands were taken. We probably need, Mr. Speaker, some $70 million to resolve that debt. $70 million. Accumulated over a period of time, years and years of acquisition, and not no settlement taking place. This government, Mr. Speaker, is committed to settling it once and for all to settle it once and for all and to develop a clear path as to how do we proceed. Therefore, the Department of, of Planning have been mandated to come up with a strategy which I personally have more or less given them a sort of framework as to what they should, do, what they should look at, and that is a clear policy which should state that any government project for which land is required the land must be factored. The cost of the land must be factored in the cost of the project. And that cost must be played, that, that, that um, amount must be made part not of the Department of Infrastructure's commitment, but part of the respective ministries. 
Now, it may happen, Mr. Speaker, that while we may do this, it may also die the same way in those departments. But we have to come up with a mechanism to be able to create a fund, whether, whatever you call that fund, where you can allocate the resources once you've made up your mind, to put those resources into that fund to be able to dip into when you have the projects and to be able to pay those people for, for, the, um, for the land. So that, Mr. Speaker, is certainly being looked into. As we say this, Mr. Speaker, we also, and in the policy um, statement debate, I will also speak to the issues of quarries and a, a quarry policy. A quarry policy, Mr. Speaker, that will allow us to be able to manage the development and establishment of quarries, but also mindful, Mr. Speaker, that this country is about to explode with economic activity and development. And the need for resources, the need for natural resources, quarry products, we are on the edge of having to import those products, even while some people are exporting to neighboring countries. So we need to be able to develop policies on that, land use policies, so that we know where we can put quarries and where we cannot, and to avoid any misunderstanding of the general public. We also need, Mr. Speaker, uh, and it's a matter which relates to both infrastructure and physical development, we need to be strong about the development control authority, the responsibility, the status, and how do we proceed further. Because what is going on, Mr. Speaker? We believe that there's need to establish a freestanding authority to give it the manpower and the resources to be able to maintain a monitoring eye on development in this country. Too often, Mr. Speaker, private developers go in and develop their, 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 their estates, say they're providing housing, and you either have no infrastructure or substandard infrastructure, and the government is the one who has to go in eventually to take over the infrastructure without the necessary certification, without the approval of the Department of Infrastructure, and to maintain it. This we must stop, Mr. Speaker, and many of them are escaping because what has happened over the years is a behavior of having a master plan development and then going in and say, well, listen, I need to sell some land so that I can put in the infrastructure. I need to put the road. I need to put the water. I need to put the electricity. And so please allow me permission, approval for five lots, and then I will put in the infrastructure, and later on we can move on. They're given the, the five lots, the, the five lots are approved, nothing happens, and the people who are crushed are those persons who buy land from those unscrupulous de um, developers. We need to stop this, and this government will find a way of dealing with it. Mr. Speaker, we have an allocation of $387,000 to the Volt, Volt uh, expansion in the land registry. The land registry, Mr. Speaker, is becoming very critical in terms of its location, the space, the accommodation generally. It is becoming very critical. And for those of us who go to cabinet, I'm sure on a Monday morning, sometimes as you walk in, you see the crowd out there. The problem is it is busting at its seams. Not enough space for staff, not enough space for storing of, of, of the records of the registry, and so the public has to more or less flow out onto the pavement in the passage of the main building, and that is causing some problem. Not enough space in there, even for the clerks of the various lawyers and agencies, including surveyors who hope, we're hoping soon will have access to the land registry to conduct their business. So the department has asked for uh, some expansion of their vault facilities. I personally believe what the land registry needs is, in this case, the land registry needs its own 
infrastructure, it needs its own building, its own accommodation, properly designed with the, the, the proper accommodation, the proper storage facility, the proper vaults that can preserve the documents so that documents don't get destroyed and whatnot with the right temperatures inside there, etc. So we have $387,000 to this. Mr. Speaker, Yes, also, we, as it's nice that you've spoken about this. The World Bank now is engaged with us. We're looking about the digitization of the land registry. And, uh, you know, the land registry is a, is a resource. And it's a resource that we have not harnessed sufficiently. Because we are sitting there, Mr. Speaker, on information that people want, information that we in this country need, and information investors and other people from overseas need to also get in the event that they have a matter to deal with and they're interested in land in St. Lucia. So we now need, we're looking at the digitization, digitization of the land registry and the intention is to, in that process, my thoughts, in that process, to be able to get persons to subscribe, to subscribe to have access to the, to the, 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 the records of the registry. So you subscribe on an annual basis or half yearly basis and that will be increasing the revenue for the department. I must say this Mr. Speaker, do you know that a search at the registry is five dollars? Five dollars, a search, to go in and search for, for your land or get a certificate for your land, five dollars. That, that, that my, I must say, I recall I, when, I was in, work, when I was working in the legal um, sector a search was about $3 then, it's $5 now. But anyway, that is to indicate the potential of the registry in terms of revenue. And the third item, Mr. Speaker, on the capital in the Department of Physical Development and Urban Renewal is that of reconstruction of the, of the library, market, and square. And the parliamentary representative for library, I'm sure, um, he's quite happy that this project is finally coming, coming on and um, work, I mean the designs have been done, the allocations, first set of allocation has been made and here we see an allocation being made of 2.5 million dollars, 1 million dollars coming from loans, grants and 1.5 1 1 from, from grants and 1 million from loans. Mr. Speaker, this ends my contribution on the physical development and urban renewal. And to say, Mr. Speaker, it is a proud moment for me and I'm sure a proud moment for many of us on this side who are standing here today over the last few days and to articulate our position of what contains in the Green Book the estimates of expenditure and revenue for the country of this country. For the, for the people of this country. Mr. Speaker, those estimates have been carefully prepared. Those estimates are dedicated, they're appointed. They speak, to about, they speak to people development, human development. They speak to social upliftment. These estimates speak about lifting the people of this country, engaging the people of this country, creating opportunities, whether it is in business, small, medium, and, 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 and large businesses, the youth economy, the programs enshrined in the figures of these estimates, Mr. Speaker, are dedicated to the people of this country. It is for us, Mr. Speaker, as government, to go out and to spread the message to let the people know what it is we are doing for them. Because often, people say nothing is happening in the country. Because some people have put into their head what must happen in a country that you can equate as development is physical structure, only physical structure. But that is not what is, that is not only the, the measurement that you can, you, can, you can, the only measurement for development. Development is about developing the people to be independent, to be responsible, to, take, to, ma to make use of the opportunities that are provided in the social services, to give a lifting hand, and hopefully you will get on your own 
and you'll take charge of your own destiny. That is what this government is about, Mr. Speaker. And that is why I stand here proudly with a free conscience, a free conscience, not guarded whatsoever in what I say. Very clear that what this government is doing is not talk and more talk, cheap talk and fancy talk. It's about the affairs of the country. And I'm looking forward, Mr. Speaker, in my support of this resolution, to the implementation of this budget, to the impact that it will have on the people of this country, the old, the young, the marginalized, the working class, the professionals, the young people who are looking for opportunity and are seeking hope. For those who have intentions, who have ideas, who want to participate in this country, who want to rise in this country as a consequence of a government who cares, I look forward to that day. And I believe under, under the leadership of the parliamentary representative for Castries East, under his representation, I am sure not only me will say, but the rest of the people will say, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. I thank you, Mr.